Okay, well, Turnkey tries to bring you information that can help you and your organization be more successful. And we're continuing to do that during the COVID-19 pandemic. This afternoon, we are addressing how you can quote unquote, weaponize your words to maximize your Giving Tuesday Now fundraising, which is coming up on May 5th. Before I introduce our speakers, a couple of housekeeping items. We are recording this webinar and we will share that recording and the PowerPoint deck with you tomorrow. Um, so you don't have to worry too much about taking notes or screenshotting. Um, we're gonna put everything on our COVID-19 resource page and send it to you in an email. Also, we definitely want to answer all of your questions. The best way to ask the questions is with the Q&A icon that should either be at the top or the bottom of your Zoom screen. We will either answer the questions um, as they come up if, if they are relevant to the flow or certainly at the end. Um, so we'll, we'll be sure to save time at the end. So our speakers, first we have Otis Fulton, who is the Vice President of Psychological Strategy at Turnkey. He speaks regularly on the psychology of fundraising at national conferences. He writes a weekly blog on psychology and fundraising for Nonprofit Pro and is the co-author of the 2017 book, Dollar Dash, The Behavioral Economics of Peer-to-Peer -peer Fundraising. Otis has degrees in social psychology from Virginia Commonwealth University and the University of Virginia. We also have Vicki Labello, who's the lead strategist at Turnkey. She has been working in the nonprofit sector in senior leadership roles for most of her career. Her passion is helping nonprofits build to the future state they want to achieve. She has expertise in all areas of nonprofit fundraising, operations, and organizational development. She has had the opportunity to implement many changes within the organizations where she has worked, either as a leader or as a consultant. And now I will turn it over to Otis. Actually, Vicki. No, oh, I'm so sorry. That's okay. No worries. Welcome, everybody. Um, what steps do you need to take prior to asking for help? So before I go um, into that, weaponizing your words is all about finding the right tone and that we are acknowledging and understanding our supporters during this difficult time. We know there are methods to engage people in fundraising and your mission that are worthy of the effort. Um, we want to acknowledge as part of the steps you need to take prior to asking for help. Um, Otis has spoken about that on a couple of other webinars, but making sure that we are, we are reaching out to our people and letting them know we're thinking of them. Okay, welcome. And just to let you know, I've shared some of the examples I'm gonna talk about today on a previous uh, social media webinar. So you'll get a double dose, but I think it's very important things. Um, this is a picture of a book um, by my friend, my friend and mentor, Tom Ahern. I recommend it highly. Um, weaponizing words, it's not just the words we use, although that's important, it's also the way that we use them. And Tom is a proponent of a donor-centric communication and I had the pleasure to spend three days with him last month in Scotland before uh, the world changed dramatically. And he's been a proponent for years of this approach for one reason, it raises more money. Um, and what is donor-centered communication? Well, it's not the way that most nonprofits talk. Jeff Brooks calls the way most nonprofits talk the Batman model, and I can tell you it's not the, the model that, that, that you wanna follow. You know, in this model, Batman's the boss, Robin's the helper, his sidekick. Batman gets all the glory, gets a cooler costume, he drives a Batmobile, throws batarangs around. Uh, the Batman model puts the organization in the starring role, and the donor is Robin, whose donations enable the work. Batman communication is full of phrases like, please donate so we help us, help the children, support this great work. There's lots of us and we. And, you know, when people are in crisis, it's even more important to make your message, messaging about them. Although, if anything comes out of this, I hope that this becomes the standard operating procedure for nonprofits uh, after this crisis is over. There's a pretty simple metric for success. How's your you count today? Uh, I know that sounds simplistic, but it, it really can tell you a lot. This is how most nonprofits talk. We did this, we did that, we were amazing. By the way, thank you. 
the it's the Robin. Batman's the one who does all the work. Robin's the helper. Thank you very much, Robin. And he's usually one that's there in the fight, getting punched in the jaw a little bit. This raises much more money. With your help, all these amazing things happened. Without your help, they, they won't. And it's a simple you can. Now, it sounds very simple. It's actually harder to execute than it is than it than 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 it sounds. I've looked at uh, hundreds, thousands of messaging from uh, nonprofits, and and they're just not used to talking that way. And, and the answer is this: you know, just like your support, your, your supporter, your fundraiser, your donor, they're concerned about you. We, as an organization, we're concerned about us too. And so we just think that if we communicate our mission and so forth, that that will convince people to support us. But making it about them is really the way to. Uh, uh, to engage them in what you do. And Tom makes a great point in his book. Donors are not giving to you. They're giving through you to make something important happen. You're really fulfilling an aspect of their life that empowers them and so forth. And we'll talk more about why that's so important in this current crisis, but it's really an opportunity for you to engage them in something that they will feel is extremely meaningful. Hey, Otis. Yeah. Before you go on, we have a question. Um, yeah. How do I do this with volunteer fundraisers versus donors? That's a great question. I just locked the door because we have a, 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 an, an adult uh, special needs person walking around out there. Um, uh, whenever I say donor, just think of fundraiser, constituent. Uh, we actually had a, a discussion about what words, words to use. But anybody that supports your organization, volunteer, um, it, it's really all, all the same. And I thought that this was a great, you know, at the end of this, when people are through with, with the crisis, uh, this is what you want them to be able to say when they come through the other side. During the coronavirus pandemic, my ALS association family remembered me and did their very best to help me through it. If your supporters, your donors, your fundraisers, all the people that are involved with your organization can say that, you're going to be fine. Uh, you've succeeded. And it's absolutely the most important thing to focus on right now. So let's take a look at an example. This is from the UK, the Royal Naval Lifeboat Institute. Uh, the UK doesn't have a Coast Guard. They depend on these uh, network of privately funded lifeboat rescues. You know, they're, they're a big island and people get in trouble. So they rescue them just like the Coast Guard do. They depend on private donations. Interestingly, most of their supporters are old retired people. And so this gives them a chance to be heroic, to be part of the crew. And so this was a message that they sent to their supporters uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, the height of the whole Corona thing, the UK had just been locked down. Uh, I was actually in the UK on the 11th, uh, so everything changed in that week. Even these difficult times, supporters like are still making a difference every day and so forth. Now, who's this about? It's about you. It's not about the organization. It's about you. It's about what you enable them to do. And they also have a great video that I'll share with you here. I hope the sound is working right. It's also got subtitles, but I want to show you this because this is the way to do it right here. This is the messaging you need to be sending to your folks right now. Hi there, my name's Dave and I'm a volunteer crew member. When we answer the call for help, it's an uncertain time. We don't know what we'll face and we don't know when we'll see our loved ones again. But the thing that keeps us going is your support. And now, wherever you are, you're probably feeling uncertain about the future too. That's why I wanted to get in touch and say, today, we're sending our support to you. Because you're part of the crew and crew members look out for each other. So on behalf of the Lifesavers, thank you so much for thinking of us in the past. Right now, we're thinking of you too. We hope you're able to stay safe and well. From everyone at the RNLI, take care. That's the way you do it. You know, I know a major U.S. nonprofit who 
hasn't messaged its people since March 15th. And, you know, I would say, whoop, go one more. I want to see Dave again. You know, you can't thank your folks enough right now. If you've thanked them before, thank them again. <laughs> thank them every week. <laughs> when in doubt, thank your supporters. Uh, this is not the time to acquire new supporters. This is the time to consolidate your relationships with your existing uh, supporters. Uh, in the last uh, economic downturn in 2007, 2009, although this is very different, but it's still going to be a recession. Uh, people lost supporters, but the people that remained more than more than made up for the losses that uh, uh, that the supporters who who left um, uh, 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 made. So this is the time to really uh, solidify these relationships. Hey, Otis. Yes. There's a question. Uh, there's some guidance that says don't say supporters like you instead of just saying you. What are your thoughts? thoughts on that distinction? You know, I absolutely, uh, and this is kind of a compressed version. Uh, as I said, it, it's not as simple as it sounds. Um, uh, my, one of my mentors, Jen, Dr. Jen Chang at the Institute for Sustainable Philanthropy, she doesn't like the, the term donor at all because she says that you're, you're only emphasizing that you're in a relationship because they give you money. She just calls them your people. And so, yes, I, I absolutely think that that's, that, that's the way to go. Uh, focusing it on the use as much as possible uh, is, is, the, is, is absolutely the, the, the right path to, to go down. I'll talk a little bit more about the, the type of messaging in a few minutes. This is a question that we get more than uh, any, is it okay to fundraise now? Absolutely, it's okay to fundraise. But it's so important to get the tone of the messaging right. And here's something, you have a secret superpower right now. You have the power to make your donors feel empowered, to make your donors feel less stressed. There's a lot of research that says that pro-social behavior, doing just doing good charitable work, doing good for someone else, uh, mitigates the effects of stress in everyday life and we need that more than ever today. So you really have a gift to give to your people and uh, you've just got to do it in, in a way that uh, resonates with them and emphasizes your relationship. Um, I often say, if you think about messaging your sister right now, you probably talked about your people as being part of the ALS or American Cancer Society family in the past. Well, if you have, treat them like, like such. Talk to them like they're a member of your family. And so I think that that's a good little, little uh, rule of thumb for is this messaging appropriate? And after you thank them, thank them some more. Uh, these next powers, uh, these next messages, as I said, really empower your constituents because, again, they're working through you to achieve something in their own lives. It's very important to, to think of them that way. So these, these messages talking about BOI, because of you, this, this happened. Before and after stories, a woman was in crisis, now she's safe because of you. Tell them why they're needed and again, make them a part of something. A friend of mine, John Varanis, is the CDO at the Humane Society, and they put up this Facebook fundraiser last week, and I talked to him about it. Now, notice uh, they had 659 donors, donors for this, uh, including me. Their average donation was $34. And I called him and I said, you know, tell me a little bit about this campaign. He said, our goal was to let people know we're still in business and that we still need their support. Um, and I thought that this was very, uh, very interesting and very good too. He said that they do an equal number of messages that ask for a donation and an equal number of messages that are just updates saying, this is what happened. Uh, and I think that that's very, very important. And he, wanted, he said, we wanted to do this to remind donors how important they are to what the organization accomplishes and that they're making a lot of things happen through the Humane Society. And again, uh, my rule of thumb is when you ask for more, thank them for more. 
thank them more. Um, you just can't thank people enough in these times. Vicki, would you like to tell us about crowdfunding? Absolutely. Um, we're going to talk um, a bit about, uh, well, we're going to talk for a while about crowdfunding. And um, I wanted to start on the next slide with level setting. Um, a lot of people use uh, the term crowdfunding, um, and it's, it's confused with a lot of different areas. I will say in the peer-to-peer -peer space in crowdfunding, there are a lot of similarities. Um, you start with your true believers, your the center of your your target and and of course their friends and then get reach to the crowd um, that's very similar to peer to peer but not not exactly the same so um, crowdfunding though is um, a fundraising campaign targeted at people who love you which if you do well spreads from your friends to their friends and from them to the crowd while there are lots of flavors of crowdfunding the most important components are a project that needs to be funded, um, usually a project, not an organization, a fixed goal that needs to be raised, and a time frame that the fundraising campaign runs for. So best practices in crowdfunding. Um, we have a few of these that are, go ahead and advance it, Otis, um, that are proven in the industry and are readily available. Um, and hopefully you're all familiar with these, um, make smart goals, choose the right tool for your crowdfunding initiative, um, keep your audience posted, all the things Otis just described with the Humane Society, um, giving them a reason to give and thank them. I'm going to add another component, which is um, primarily my own. Go ahead, Otis. And that's the human connection. Um, I think we're, where I see some nonprofits um, having challenges with crowdfunding campaigns is they don't overtly consider the human connection or the human strategy as a part of their crowdfunding campaign. And this can be um, fairly simple. It can be identifying some influencers, community influencers, not paid influencers, that are really um, going to help you magnify the message. In order to achieve the maximum results for your crowdfunding campaign, um, we need you to, to create some thoughtful and purposeful components that rely on people leading the charge. This can be user-generated content, um, a group of ambassadors for the program. The more people you can engage in the effort prior to launch um, and during the launch, the stronger your outcomes will be. So we pulled up a couple of, um, of areas that are evidence that crowdfunding works now. This is from my marketplace. Uh, I live in Los Angeles, in the Los Angeles area. And uh, this crowdfunding campaign went out, of course, as a response to COVID-19. But as you can see on April 2nd, in the midst of all of this, and I think we were, I think we were in week two, um, it sort of blurs and runs together at that point they launched this campaign. Now I wanna draw your attention to, they had Channel 2 News, the Chargers, they had some very strong hitters and, and some um, arts and entertainment talent as part of this. So there was very much a, a human component along with a lot of marketing and reach. Um, and they were able to raise 1.6 million um, in a fairly small, short time frame. This was from a couple of days ago. So if you look at their website, you may see that their, their outcomes were we're better. I bring this to your attention as evidence on, on the now. I hear a lot of our clients talking about whether or not this is the right time to fundraise or whether or not we should ask people for money. And you're, you're right, there are some people who won't be able to give, but some people still will. And giving them the opportunity to engage through donation is, is a gift in some ways. They want to help. They're feeling disempowered. They're alone. This is another one, a similar one. This one um, I wouldn't have heard of, it's not in my marketplace, but um, heard of it from a, a client who um, basically said this community foundation in their area in Western Massachusetts, um, there was no application process for being the recipient, a nonprofit recipient of these funds. They, they received a check in the mail, um, which I think is wonderful on many parts. The, you know, the response fund went out and did their crowdfunding initiative it was targeted to support local communities in the geography and then distributed the funds without any heavy lift on, on the part of the nonprofits. Biggest 
crowdfunding is giving Tuesday. Hopefully you've all seen the outcomes from, from last year's December Tuesday. Um, I hadn't looked at them in a while. It was an amazing success. Um, this is a lot of revenue being generated on a single day, primarily from online giving. And of course, Giving Tuesday now. So this is new um, and kudos to the folks at Giving Tuesday to offer a crowdfunding campaign that any nonprofit can be a part of. Um, you'll see the, the graphic image in the back. Um, when people donate, they'll be able to um, put a heart on the map, basically. Um, this, this campaign, I believe, will have a lot of opportunity. Um, the general public is very familiar with Giving Tuesday, and it offers us the opportunity to help your constituents from your nonprofit and others know that they're part of something bigger. So this is primarily the high-level overview um, of Giving Tuesday now, Global Day of Giving, similar to Giving Tuesday, but very much focused on on response to COVID-19. And if you haven't heard it, about it, their, their website is live and you can certainly go there and look at it. Um, lots of great assets available for nonprofits, large and small. Um, I do think this will generate, given, given the history of Giving Tuesday in December, I, I believe personally that this will um, generate a lot of revenue opportunity for nonprofits. Why crowdfund now? Um, which is a great question. I actually had a, a client ask me this question. It, it's a new way to engage your audience, um, especially during the time that you're probably not having events. Most of us are not. Social distancing rules apply. You can crowdfund and still maintain your six feet or more social distance. And we all need to fund our mission. Um, our missions have not changed in some ways. Uh, providing support to our mission is harder now than ever before. Oh, the slide's got psychology on it. It's my slide, so let me talk. That's about right. It. That's the rule. Yeah. <laughs> Just you know, the, the, fr <laughs> frankly, the psychology behind crowdfunding is the same as uh, you know behind fundraising in general. Uh, people feel isolated right now. Uh, they feel powerless, and so your appeal should empower them and uh, show how they can make a difference. Uh, I also think it's important, uh, a study that came to mind as I was thinking about this, it's a classic study by the famous uh, social psychologist Robert Cialdini done about 50 years ago now, gosh, 40, 50 years ago. Uh, you can Google it, it's called Even a Penny Will Help. They went out and they made a, a, an appeal door to door for the American Cancer Society and they said, for, to one group, I'm collecting money for the American Cancer Society. Would you be willing to help by giving a donation? And it turned out that 29% of the people responded yes. And then to that same appeal, the only thing they did different, different was they added even a penny will help. And in that case, 50% of the people donated. Now, you know, you've got a, it's kind of a situation like the American Cancer Society. People uh, are uh, concerned about, I don't have much money. What can I do to... to to cure cancer, but by legitimizing their donation, uh, you can raise a lot more money. I often, when I write copy for non, non our nonprofit clients, I'll be use the line, even a dollar will help, uh, which has also been shown to have a very, very similar kind of a success rate. So um, the psychology behind crowdfunding is exactly the same as the psychology behind regular fundraising. And one thing that we know is that people behave more pro-socially in public than they do in private. So whatever you can do to promote this and to uh, recognize people publicly on Facebook, on, on whatever channel that they're on, uh, is going to result in greater participation. That's an important addition, Otis. Thank you for mentioning it. Um, the fact that even a small amount will help. I, I think um, people are, are asking that question given where they are whatever their situation is due to COVID-19 and what difference will my, my $1, my $5, my $20 make? We get this in, in regular times as well. And, um, and, so and, and just, just saying that to people increases participation by 80%. It, it, I yeah. think it's very important, those little things. People need to know. Uh, we have a comment um, in Canada yesterday, almost one, people, one million people um, applied for emergency benefits and there will be another million later this week. 
unemployment may reach 20%. Is this really a good time to fundraise? Um, if you are directly involved with emergency service, example, homeless shelter or food bank, but if you're not, question. Nobody has money these days, especially in Alberta, which has been decimated by the decline in the price of oil. I can tell you that my son is an unemployed restaurant worker and he's still donating to Bernie Sanders. So um, that's a small anecdote, but I think that people really do want to make a difference. Yes, uh, your everyone is not going to be able to make to make a donation. I think it's very important though to empower people and to let them see what uh, the results of their participation will be. Uh, also to tell them, you've been with us in good times and bad times. You don't have to make it, we're not asking you to make a donation now, but your investment will not go to waste. We know we're important to you. We know the mission's important to you. And uh, framing it in those kinds of ways will uh, go a long way uh, to, um, you know, not, not seeming crass and yet uh, including them in part of your community? It, it's a great question. We, the messaging needs to be sensitive to where people are in the different markets. And I, I agree with Otis, um, even though I, I know personally some folks who have been laid off um, because of the situation, um, not all of them are still donating, but they're still interested and engaged in the communication with their nonprofit. So, yeah, so, so you, you know, it, it, it's like John Varenas at the Humane Society. They're sending out those updates. Uh, and I think that that's so important for, for, for your people to get those kind of messages. It is, um, and I'll add to that. I think the, the piece of that is as our world shifts around us, or shall I say, turns upside down, because I know there's some days I feel like my world has turned upside down. It, it's nice to know. Um, whether it's local community nonprofits, I got an email from one of the nonprofits in the community I support, and and it was basically just a we're still here, we're we're here and helping the community, um, and it didn't have a solicitation in it. It was just a very friendly we're still here. Of course, there was a way to donate if you clicked through, but um, not tone deaf, um, very much interested in in who's still open for business, basically, because so many of our businesses in our local communities are closed right now. Um, to that note, providing grace and options. Um, so some of your people may not be able to support you through fundraising for the many reasons that we've just discussed and you're all aware of. If you can, give them another option. We recommend adding a volunteer option if that's possible for your organization. Um, Hopefully most of you know that folks who volunteer for your organization are more likely to not just donate once, but mul donate multiple times. If during this time when they can't afford to do a donation or support your organization um, through their resources, if they make a conscious decision to, to volunteer in some way, whatever that looks like for you, um, they are more likely to give when they can give, which is definitely the tone we want to strike, I believe, right, right Otis? Oh, absolutely. Um, it doesn't, you know, you don't need to offer a specific role for them to volunteer in or even a big job. Our only caution on this strategy is that your organization is able to follow up with people that select volunteering. Individuals who volunteer um, for the organization, as I mentioned, are, are more likely to um, fundraise for you, but, but stick with you for the long term. Um, to me, this is, this is, again, an awareness of we're, we're in this together and um, you can help in different ways than maybe you have in the past to help them to, um, to really take a look at what they want to do for your organization. What now? So um, whether you choose to engage in Giving Tuesday now or do your own crowdfunding campaign, this is, one fundraising action that is worthy of your time um, during a pandemic. Again, as we mentioned earlier, we wanna make sure that you are taking the right approach, that you're thinking about where your constituents are. Um, I'll also add that, you know, while many people are being very negatively impacted by the pandemic and are facing a personal state of crisis, there are others out there that may be in a different financial situation that are able to donate even during this difficult time. 
And we left time for, for questions or feedback from the group. You didn't explain what Tongues Out Tuesday was. That was a, no one knew what that was. Oh, um, a dog thing, wasn't it? it, it's a, it, it yeah. yeah it's a, it's a, I'm uh, not very familiar with it either, are you? No, no. <laughs> I will also say I'm wearing sweatpants. The, so. <laughs> I'll just say I'm wearing pants. Any questions from the group, uh, maybe around uh, or, or information to share? Um, would love to hear from some of the group on how Giving Tuesday has worked well for your organization as well. Um, have one, we've postponed and updated the dates for our events and programs for the next two months. So um, we don't have many more updates to give to our, our community and donors. What kind of messaging should we send or how should we situate ourselves to make that ask? Is it a waste to send something out without having a meaningful update to provide? Otis, you want to take first run at that? Or yeah, yeah, yeah I, I would say yes. I really, uh, uh, I really counsel against canceling things and putting it into language that says we're, we're, we're uh, rescheduling this date to be announced, something like that. It, it, it gives folks the impression that um, hey, listen, uh, this is the work's going to go on and uh, the work's not stopping. So when I think that when people see events canceled, they think that the work is being canceled, is being slowed down as well. But uh, so I, I would caution against canceling and just and rescheduling. You don't, you don't have to pay, pick the date right now. I'll also add, I have a couple of clients, many clients, I, I think all of them at this point, that are messaging rather than about the event, how the organization is adapting to um, the new reality and delivering program or supporting their, their people. Um, whether that means, you know, supporting affected population through um, phone support, Zoom meetings, those kinds of things. So I think there are things in most organizations to communicate, but agree with Otis, I wouldn't lead in with the, we had to cancel events, therefore you should do a thing, but really about how, how the uh, COVID-19 thing is, um, how you're having to pivot and needing to provide support to the communities you serve. Our next one is, what is our recommendation for organizations that already adjusted their fundraising and communication plans, and those plans are underway? But then now there's, um, uh, there's Giving Tuesday now. Should we be jumping on the bandwagon? How do we incorporate that? Otis, I'll let you take first run again. Well, Giving Tuesday is gonna be crowded. Uh, it, it's just like, uh, just, just like the, what, what was it? the first Tuesday, the first Thursday, the right around Thanksgiving. Um, so I would say if you've got, got uh, your campaign planned out and you've made adjustments and so forth, go forth. Uh, why wait? Vicki? I would add to that, uh, again, um, some clients are adjusting their uh, revenue goals um, based on what their, their um, what they feel like they're going to make in the year ahead. Um, I, I think it is a nice opportunity if you have space in your calendar to, to take advantage of the opportunity of Giving Tuesday now and um, while, while creating not being tone deaf and all the things that we've talked about, um, engaging with your audience and seeing if there's interest. It's a nice dip, sort of a dip your toe in the water if you don't wanna go all in. Um, for other organizations that haven't gone as far as you have, um, they may want to go more fully into the opportunity. Our next question is, do we know if Facebook will match this Giving Tuesday? I do not. I, I spent a bit of time on their website. If somebody on, on the line does have an answer to that, um, please answer on our behalf. I, I didn't see a mention um, on Facebook or on the Giving Tuesday website that answers this question. Okay, on a scale of um, one, one to, ten. to 10, how much internal investment in Giving Tuesday now versus less time bound efforts? I, I'm not sure I can answer this given the fact that I'd, I'd need to know more about less time bound efforts, um, what those efforts are expected to achieve and um, what sort of resourcing you're going to need to do with it. Um, I will say that Giving Tuesday has a good history of success and it is a voice that the, the general population will um, 
you know, listens to, understands. It's a language that is built into the fiber of the fabric of nonprofit giving. So I do think it's worthy of the effort. Um, as far as scaling, I'm, I'm not sure I can do that. Otis, any additional comments on that? No, I think it's, I think that's spot on that. And I think that, you know, you kind of answered the next question too. How big a deal should we be making of Giving Tuesday now? Depends on what your other plans are. If you already have your own, you know, crowdfunding campaign launched and um, Giving Tuesday, you feel will not help you to magnify your message or get your get the word out about what your organization needs in this moment in time, um, you may want to, you know, not make a big deal about it. But for many organizations, um, I expect that there will be some that make a, a big deal of it because it is a good opportunity. Um, isn't it the very nature of Giving Tuesday non-donor centric? It's made up a day that we, the nonprofit sector, invented and decided to promote ourselves, to benefit ourselves. We are telling donors when to donate and not asking for their timetable. Thoughts? Otis? Sounds like a Canadian, I know Dave Todd, I, uh, <laughs> in Canada. That, that actually is, 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 is a great question. And um, uh, I think that there is some benefit in setting expectations for people that there's going to be an ask made. I think that you can make it donor centric or people centric uh, in the way that you craft your messaging. Um, but I do think that there's some good for having a, uh, um, uh, who, who, what's the organization that has their, their big fundraiser on the longest day? Uh, uh, Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's, exactly. So people expect that and they're ready for the messaging. The, sometimes they save up for that. And um, so I think that there's some benefit in having that expectation set, but it, it uh, Dave, it's really all in the way that you message around the, the event. I would agree. I've seen organizations um, use the templates just straight out of the, off the website on Giving Tuesday and others be very, um, create their own messaging that, that speaks to donor centricity. I think that the day is really about creating volume and noise and f people feeling part of something bigger, but your message will, will ensure that you're able to stick to it. Um, Dave, great question though. I, I know early yeah. in the Giving Tuesday years, I had asked similar questions. Well, you know, you know uh, just uh, as an example, March of Dimes had a great campaign last week where they sent out a uh, little, they emailed a little template of a mustache uh, that people could print and then paste the mustache on their babies and then post it on the uh, March of Dimes Facebook site. And any device like that that you can do to generate interest uh, is, is something that, that can only benefit you. We have another one. Um, with Giving Tuesday now a little less than a month away, we are starting to develop plans now. But how do we ensure the messaging is still relevant in a month? Things are changing daily, even hourly, and we, we won't know what our country and region will look like in a month. Otis, you want to jump in here first? I would assume that it's going to look just pretty much like it does right now. Uh, that would be my, my assumption. Uh, I told my kids that, you know, if they want to give me a gift for the next five months, it's going to be bourbon or sweatpants because I am hunkered down for the long haul. And seriously, I don't mean to make a joke about it, but, uh, but I would assume it's going, I would, my recommendation would be to assume it's going to be exactly as it is today, not much better, not much worse. And I'll add as a, um, a strategist, I always think about the what if, what if it changed? What if tomorrow, um, you know, it was brought forward that there is a, a vaccine or something and everything does change. Um, while your messaging may shift a bit, I believe we will all be feeling the effects of this crisis, this pandemic, even after the moment the, the problem, the health problem is solved. Um, so I, I still think you should move forward with making plans because your organization, all of us in our personal lives and our nonprofit work will be impacted by the pandemic for a long time. And I think this is the last one we have right now. Um, uh, what other recommendations do we have to pivot the lifeboat message of we're thinking of you too, to a message of needing donations for Giving Tuesday Now campaign. It feels like a swift turn in less than a month. Um, 
You know, I don't think so. I, I think that, again, you emphasize what the individual is accomplishing through participation in the organization. I think that's the, ver that's the crucial uh, way to frame the messaging. And if you do that, I think that uh, it will be very successful and it won't be, it won't be out of place. Uh, Vicki? Yeah, I, I would agree. Um, it, it is, it, it, I'm sure it feels like it's short. I've done this type of campaign before and um, May is, is soon. Um, my guess is, and I, I don't work with the folks at Giving Tuesday, is the goal was really finding a date where, where the pandemic was still fresh, even if the problem is solved at some point, um, and making sure that we're offering this opportunity, the reach of Giving Tuesday at a time that's most meaningful. I guess I would say, I, well, I wouldn't guess. I, I agree with Otis. I don't know that you have to go super complicated. Um, again, some organizations will use the tools that are readily available and do those. Um, I think what this person is alluding to is there may not be the opportunity to create a lifeboat video um, as wonderful as that video right. is in preparation for Giving Tuesday now. Right. And I would agree with that. I'm, I'm not sure that I would invest that sort of resourcing to this effort specifically. Yeah, you know, you know when, when, I, when I write these update messages, um, I start off and I just write at the top of the page, BOY, because of you. And then I list out a few things that might go into the message. And if I ever say, because of you, we were able, I scratch out the we were able, and I just get to the punchline. Um, four women got help on a crisis hotline. Instead of we were able to help four women on a crisis hotline, because of you, four women were able to get help on a crisis hotline. If you message in that way, um, that goes right to the individual's participation. And we know that that's the most effective way to engage the audience and make them feel empowered, which is a great gift that you can give them right now. It will reduce their stress. Yeah. Um, are there swift turns going, are swift turns going to go away after COVID? Seems like a new standard, especially with all social media communications that are part of our lives now. We don't have three weeks to create proof, committee, edit, and, um, will this change now? Otis? Yeah, I'll get on the soapbox. I, I think that the, the, the chief development officer should be the person that uh, he or she is the person that is charged with bringing in the money. There should be two eyes that approve uh, any messaging that goes out and that belong, those two eyes belong to the, to the CDO. So uh, I think that if you shorten the committee process and so forth and have the CDO work with one person, who's doing the writing and so forth, that that will uh, cut through a lot of red tape. I'll add to that that I, I'm seeing um, a, a stronger focus on user-generated content um, amongst our clients that, are, that don't have the opportunity for, for all those... Uh, <laughs> All those edits back and forth. I'll also say that as we are all spending more time in front of screens, um, it feels like the uh, less corporate framed, more user based content um, that isn't well orchestrated is, is generating more appeal or more interest on the part of the public as a whole. Any other questions? Uh, Dave Todd in Canada said Otis Bourbon, single malt scotch instead. Uh, Dave, I got used to when I was in Scotland, I, I did uh, acclimate to the local, local and I did drink quite a bit of scotch. Great point. Okay, Kelly, you're going to talk to us about what's happening next, I believe. Yes, so just um, wanted to let you all know, if you need more help, you can contact Joanne. You see her email address there. Um, and we also have, we're gonna continue to be bringing you COVID-19 related webinars um, to help you fundraise during this pandemic. We have one this 
Thursday afternoon um, in two days about Facebook fundraising specifically um, right now in the midst of COVID-19. Um, and next week, we are going to bring you um, again on Tuesday and Thursday. Um, Tuesday afternoon will be more in depth on how to message when it's crass to be fundraising. Um, that, that is a webinar that is backed by popular demand. Um, and so we're gonna do that for you on Tuesday afternoon. And then on Thursday afternoon, um, we are also going to um, reprise a popular webinar on engaging your volunteers during this pandemic. So all, all the information um, to register is there on the website on our homepage, um, as well as recordings and resources from previous webinars. Well, thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, thank you. If there are no further questions, we'll, we'll say goodbye until the next time. Thank you. Take care. Stay safe. Bye.